You're listening to Graphic Novel Explorers Club Podcast, an audio book club. Greetings, Explorers. I'm one of your hosts, Dennis T. Logan. Joined by... Johnny Theodore Esquire. I don't even... I got their names mixed up. <laughs> yeah, so did I. And we're Graphic Novel Explorers Club. Today, we're discussing Bill and Ted are Doomed by Evan Dorkin, an artist... Roger Landridge. We hope you've read today's totally bogus title because all two of us have. So beware. Spoilers ahead. Graphic Novel Explorers Club is available wherever fine podcasts are found, including YouTube. So be sure to leave a review and subscribe wherever you listen to the show. Righteous. That's right. We're back. With our final episode of the summer special. And we're looking at Bill and Ted are doomed by writer Evan Dorkin and artist Roger Langridge. And uh, Ed Solomon, who wrote uh, the first movie, Excellent Adventure, was the consultant for this. And you can feel his, like, thumbprint on the story. Absolutely. And it, also, Evan had written, I believe, and illustrated the original run of Bill and Ted's comics back for Marvel in the early 90s. So, Oh, really? There, yeah, so there's a lot of... Just like full circle, a lot yeah, of yeah, exactly, and then you can tell, with it. and like you said, you can tell when someone really knows the character. Like you know, when you see a writer who actually really knows Batman, that you can feel there's connective tissue to past stories yeah. or what have you. I never actually read those comics. I just happened to look and because, like you, I I, I realized how ingrained this story is to like the universe and how well it's written. And then besides the screenwriter. I found out that Evan had worked on those comics. And, you know, honestly, it's weird to me, uh, but and this is kind of a tangent, but he's only 10 years older than us. And Oh, is he really? I didn't realize yeah. that. Yeah, he's like 56 or something. And what's weird is he worked on a lot of shit like that we're fans of or I remember reading even in the early 90s. Like he did a I don't know exactly at what capacity. I don't think illustration. But he worked on a particular miniseries of Predator for Dark Horse back in the day called Big Game, where uh, he fights a Native American soldier. And I love that comic. That's one of the few Predator comics I actually bought back in the day, besides the original. And he worked on that. He's worked on Superman, the animated series. He did the, the I think he wrote the episode that had Livewire, which introduced a new character. He's done a bunch of shit. And to me, it's like, wow, you're only 10 years older than us. And when we were just like, you know, jerking off in high school... You were already producing like amazing material that, you know, we would grow to love. And then, yeah, he was working on the Bill and Ted comics, I believe, at least illustrating, if not writing it as well. And then he wrote one of our favorite books, uh, Beasts of Burden, which we reviewed in in episode 68. And at the time that we're recording this, I believe a brand new Beasts of Burden book just came out. Awesome. Yeah, I think a new one was released, so. But that's cool, man. Yeah, I didn't know about. I, I, we're I, I've become a huge fan of Evan Dorkin, both of his last name and the things that he's written. <laughs> uh, man, you know what? You have to when your name last name is Dorkin, you have to excel. Like that's like a <laughs> that's like a boy named Sue, right? You just yeah. through a pit of fire. You you have to be a great writer, a great illustrator, and just make a <laughs> shit ton of money to show those bullies like fuck you. <laughs> I wonder if that's his real last name or if it's a pen name. Uh, that's true. I mean, it's too good to be true, right? Like, it, yeah. it's it's like an awesome name. Who's the other... There's another comic book artist. Not that Evan's a, a comic book artist, but there's a... Who has a funky last name, and we were like, that's gotta be fake. Right, uh, right. I forget what it is. So the premise of the story is basically Bill and Ted, who are the Wild Stallions, I have again put the, the future in peril, or, or uh, maybe will not come to uh the full fruition of their their promise and this time it's because there's like <laughs> they have it's very much more like adult reasons why they may not fulfill their promises because they're in debt they they have written a good song and like or released an album in five years by the time the story's picking up and then they decide without any real input from their wives or the rest of the band to go on a world tour There's giant robots in this. There's an evil rock band. This was really fun. I I don't know if I could, if this was an ongoing series, if I could, if I could stomach it, It, it's, it's a little too much Bill and Ted, but it was fun to like revisit this, especially with, uh, 
Bill and Ted face the music having come out last year. It was, and, it was fun and, just to revisit the characters. Absolutely. And this bogus journey and perfectly fits in within the narrative of the continuity. It takes place before face of music. It, it dovetails right in. Well, not right into face of music, but it face of music takes care of some of the plot points that are introduced in this. And it, it was made to be a prequel to that movie. And I think it, it pays great homage to the first two films, explains away a lot of the characters that came up in those films that just disappeared by the time the new movie came around, yeah. uh, like the, the robots and uh, the alien. And I loved it. I, yeah, I loved it. Yeah, station. And I love that they address those because I was missing them. I was like, well, what happened to those guys? Yeah. And it totally fills in the blanks for that. But it doesn't feel like like I used to eat up a lot of these kind of either uh, adapted from the film comics or like prequels to the movie. And a lot of times they just feel like they're fulfilling some sort of contractual obligation. Maybe they're trying to hook some kids into watching the movie. So they'll throw in a comic that Eh, it doesn't really feel like the comic book characters or whatever, but this one totally fits into the voice of Bill and Ted. Everything is great. I loved the evil heavy metal bands. Yeah. Uh, especially, what was it? Necromonic Clown, which was a bunch <laughs> of evil clowns. The the uh, And it's ridiculous. You're right. I, I wouldn't be able to take this on a regular basis, but it feels like it's this weird blend of, I don't know, like like an Archie comic. With like the earnestness of Bill and Ted, it, it's good for what it is, and uh, in this is small amount, I don't think any pages are yeah. wasted or any issues are wasted either. Because Bill and Ted are, uh, yeah, I think our Archie comic is a good comparison. Because like in, in that Bill and Ted are, they're they're basically like sweet, innocent mm-hmm. characters. You know, right. they're not they're not malicious. They don't that while they do like their wives and and when they're first introduced in excellent adventure, like they're, they're definitely like horn dogs for them, but they're not right. like gross, you know, right. or, or, or like eighties when the first movie came out, like eighties, gross horn dogs. Right. They're, they're not porkies or revenge of the yeah. nerds. They're ironically clean cut rockers. You know, like despite, <laughs> yeah. the, despite their stoner personification, they're really actually super innocent in a, yeah, jughead sort of way. Yeah, they yeah, because you're right. Like they don't drink. You never see them mm-hmm. drink. They it's you assume they're potheads, but you never see them actually right smoke weed or anything. Yeah, they hang around the Circle K like like it's clerks, but you know they're not you know token and up or anything. Yeah, they're just more. They just want to eat. They're like uh, Ninja Turtles where they just want to eat pizza right. all the time. Exactly. <laughs> And then that was that must have been a creative decision because I don't know if you looked at the back of the comic and I love this when they do this in comics and you usually only get it in the trades is they do a little behind the scenes sometimes they do some character studies uh, yeah. and stuff and it looked like they had gone through some different iterations of how Bill and Ted were going to look like they purposely made them look like the second movie for continuity purposes they made them more cartoony there was some more realistic takes and I think it was a good decision to kind of have this almost jughead looking art and not, and not realistic and yeah i think i think it really worked and the whole tone of the book is great i mean you know when are you going to have it where there's a whole heavy metal town and they have heavy metal snowmobiles i mean <laughs> yeah. it's just it's just like that all that stuff just works yeah the population is 666 and, right exactly uh, like like real on the nose like corny humor humor yeah. but i loved it yeah it was so my only critique thing that I didn't like in the book was the beginning of it because Mm -hmm. I mean, I get, you have to bring the the readers if they're not familiar with the characters, but I'm like, who other than Bill and Ted, like our generation is going to be reading this book. You know, I, I I don't know if it's going to appeal to a younger demographic because it's of its era, you know? Right. I was just talking to someone about this, about the crow. I was like, you know why none of the other crows movies worked (laughs) other than the first one is because, that goth era ended by like 94, 95 goth was like on the way out and they've tried to like recapture that. And I was like, you can't, the crow is of its era. It was just like, that was the peak of like gothiness. And right. Um, right. And you just can't, it's lightning in a jar. You can't, you can't bring that back again. But anyways, my one critique in the story that I didn't really, I was like, really at the beginning to bring the reader up to speed on who these characters are, Rufus pops in and then the the leader is explaining to Rufus 
hey, remember when you met Bill and Ted twice? And it's like, right. that's like if one of us, you know, or someone met like a famous person <laughs> and spent the entire day with them right? Um, and saved, helped them save the future. And then you had to be like, wait, who, who are you talking about? That was the only thing right. I did. Like, I know that's a little nitpicky, but I was like, they, they, no, sh- they should, it, they should have done it with a different character. If that's the case, like a student learning right. about Bill and Ted and, or have Rufus explaining to a student, like, here's the introduction to the Bill, history of Bill and Ted. And then you get up to speed that way. I totally. was just like, Rufus would remember all this shit. <laughs> or, yeah, like looking at a, like a history book or whatever they call yeah. them uh, file. But, yeah, you know, the one thing I'll say that I liked about that scene a lot that I wish the newer movie did was I love the 90s look of the leader. And I love that they kept that there with the yeah. whole, you know, really bad sci-fi sunglasses and all that. And I wish they kept that look for the future in the newer movie because the newer movie, they're kind of. I don't know, normal sci-fi, not really like that bad well, 90s like, sci-fi. So, I mean, like <laughs> their their clothing must have changed, you know, that's right. like how you... That's true. It's 30, you know, it's like 30 years later for them too. Right. Uh, but yeah, I wonder, I, I really, I actually downloaded it before we got on the air and I meant to look at them. Comixology at least has, and I, I do comicsologies like almost like Netflix kind of service because they have like a little bit of Marvel, a little bit of DC and, and other independents as well. And they had the old 90s comics on um, oh. on there. And I meant to read them to see what the tone was. Because I bet that it was very similar in tone. Where they were like, you know, Bill and Ted, they're such a one-dimensional character, right? You can't do something deep where they're like really sad about something. Like even when they're sad, it's not really like yeah, yeah, but in the next panel or two, they're, they're doing air guitars and saying right. excellent again. Right. <laughs> and then – and so I, I bet the tone – was about the same. So I, I wanted to see how the comic book carried that over. But then again, once again, once you have the writer from the movies as well as the writer from the comics involved, I'm sure the tone transferred over perfectly Yeah, from the original yeah. comics. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's not, I'm, I'm sure they weren't going down um, these like huge dark paths in the uh, <laughs> you know, where they're just like soul crushing. Uh, right. I mean, they died twice in the second movie. And seem to not really be too mentally impacted by the fact right. that they they met death, God, the devil, uh, you know, <laughs> traveled through time. <laughs> now let me ask you this because I never really gave it much thought, but like going back, and I, I must have thought about it at the time. But did you feel either one or the other was derivative or or something? Like, but Wayne's World, do you feel like? Like there was like either Wayne's World copied them or they copied Wayne's World or was it just a a certain type of tropey character type that they were both mining from that time period? Yeah, I think that's what they were doing is they were making fun of because it's another thing of its era. You don't see this anymore. Or I think they were just making fun of like rocker dudes. Right. You know, like those, those guys true. who like wore big fat sneakers. They had tight pants. Or shorts, and they usually wore three, you know, like a, a, a rock band T-shirt that was faded out and ho- had holes in it, and they usually had like a flannel shirt on, or you know, and a painter's hat. Those white painter's hats. I remember a lot of the rocker dudes around junior high and high school. They wore those like white painter hats. Oh yeah. Um, so I think it was just, you know, that that character. Um, the bus driver from Simpsons. I was going to say, yeah, what's his name? You know, yeah, something with uh, an M. Yeah. Yeah, like those characters, I think that was just an era of mm-hmm. like p- writers being intrigued by these rocker dudes who were in their 20s, you know. And then what's his name? Sean Penn's character from uh, well, original. a stoner oh, surfer guy. That's true. That's true. The rocker dude was a very specific... You know, <laughs> reminds me of this kid. <laughs> there, so there was a where where my junior high and high school were right across the street street from each other, and there was a Burger King down the street on Dewey Drive that was in between my house and the school. So I always had to pass this Burger King, and there and all of the rocker dudes and the rocker girls would all hang out in front of this Burger King, and there was this little fat kid who was part of the group. <laughs> Who had these thick Coke bottle glasses that had a that had a permanent tint to him? I, I don't know if it was like he had sensitivity to, to sun or or why, but they had like a, a brownish patina uh, on the lenses. And this fucking kid, whenever a girl would walk 
by, he would yell, mm, Bush. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what it's like at the, the two rocker dudes that I remember. And they were, I'm sure, Bill and Ted fans, you know, maybe not seeing themselves reflected. They just liked it. Mm-hmm. But there was that kid and then this other kid, Mason. I mean, can you think of a, a more rocker kid, rocker dude name than Mason <laughs> uh, who was in my grade? And he was already like a foot taller than everybody when we were in the eighth grade. And just a really strong kid. Anyways, that was it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure uh, the only rocker name more rocker than Mason is probably like Seth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mason. I'm, so were I'm you always... a fan of the films? So, yeah. So when the first movie came out, I, I liked the movie, but my best friend at the time in, in I think the eighth grade is when 89, right? Like 88, 89 is when the first movie came out. Mm-hmm. Uh, my friend, my best friend at that time, Santino, loved loved bill and ted he would (laughs) he would try and emulate them all the time and i liked him i I thought it was funny but not as much as santino and then the second one came out i think i was it was 91 that's that's nirvana so yeah so i was like 16 when that one came out and i and i had just kind of started getting into like 70s cinema Mm -hmm. so my movie taste had changed quite a (laughs) bit between the first and second movie and I just remember, like, and I think my sister and I went and actually saw it in the theater. And I was like, okay, that was, I think I might be outgrowing these movies. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? Uh, yeah. No, I liked it. I mean, the premise of a time-traveling phone booth tapped into my Doctor Who nerd as a kid. I was like, oh, this is the Americanized version of Doctor Who, almost. And, yeah, you know, and I loved that rocker persona. I think it it was around the same time as Wayne's World. And so I kind of liked that that characterization. So yeah, no, I liked them a lot. And then I actually, my son interest, interestingly enough, became really enamored with the last film, which I thought was pretty well done. I, I don't know how you feel about it. But yeah. I, I liked I feel it. like it connected pretty well. Yeah. And it felt like a good continuation of the, the like it was a good sweet wrap up and send off mm-hmm. of the two characters. It was like, I don't know if that movie would have been as well received if it had come out during the pandemic, like it came out at the perfect time where you're right. just like, I don't want to have to worry about fucking Trumpism. I don't want to have to worry about mm-hmm. this plague that might be killing everybody and people are losing their jobs and all the shit. And I was just like, I just want to escape. And like, it was like the perfect movie at that time. Just like sweet, fun, dumb movie in the best way. Dumb. Right. No, exactly. I, I think you nailed it uh, on its head in terms of like, they're dealing with the end of the world scenario again, but it's a fun end of the world. This isn't 28 days later. It's like, you're not making the right song to unite the world kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, exactly. It was, a, it was a good, I wouldn't have paid money. Honestly, it probably, no, I wouldn't it have seen it in the theater. <laughs> yeah. It might've bombed honestly in the theater yeah. if it came out, but I think it really did benefit from, from being released at the time when we were all just, uh, you know, stuck in our houses. And like you said, needing some kind of, Really, just a lighthearted, dumb film. And it like like I said, like my kid watched it with me. And so it was something that we could both enjoy. And, you know, I, I had a little more perspective. He didn't want to watch the originals, which is weird. But <laughs> really? Uh, but yeah, you know, Nate, Nate is, which, by the way, he was going to be named Mason until one of the Kardashians named their kid Mason. But Nate, um, <laughs> Nate is, is weird. It, it takes a lot of coaxing for me to get him to watch some classic films. Like it wasn't until... I showed him Aliens vs. Predator 1 and 2 that he finally wanted to watch Predator and then he loved Predator. But it, it's like I have to show him something that is kind of exciting and and, and has like a lot of uh, dumb special effects and then he'll like, oh, I kind of want to see some of the originals. <laughs> My daughter, she won't watch very many movies with me unless her friends recommend it. Like she wanted to finally see, uh, what's that film? Not Rushmore, but it's the one with the two kids, same director. Moonlight, Moonlight Kingdom. Moonlight Kingdom. I've been trying to get her to watch uh, those films uh, for a while now, and she liked the Fox animated thing that he did, but she wouldn't watch Moonlight King- Kingdom until one of her friends recommended it. And I was like, whatever it takes. We'll watch it together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to to uh, kind of get back onto this, because we talked so little about the comic book, other than oh, right. how much we loved it, was uh, 
all the main uh, like a ton of like you were saying earlier dennis about they mm-hmm. wrap up a lot of characters that popped up and didn't so uh joanna and elizabeth who are the medieval european princesses that bill and ted meet in the first movie excellent adventure are in this their daughters who are by the time of the the third movie are now more they're like teenagers but they're little girls in this and then for bogus bogus journey we have the good robots station who are these two little weird creatures who in this story become mm-hmm. one they like combine and become one big creature and uh death he was with bill and ted for most of bogus journey are all in this and then uh a little bit of trivia i was i was looking into stuff about the movies and stuff i didn't realize michael boogaloo shrimp chambers who played turbo and break in played one of the good robots in bogus journey and that then 100 percent makes sense and then another break dancer named his nickname was like taco played the other so turbo played the good robot bill and then the other break dancer played the good robot ted which if uh, you've seen those movies with their dance moves totally makes sense yeah now. there's a they're much more robotic in there you know like popping and locking stuff so i was like oh interesting tie back to who knew you could have a career, uh, movie career out of breakdancing? But uh, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought there was a couple good jokes in here, like about ska, about how they keep trying to add more people into the band, and they're right. basically like, "We're gonna have a ska band." Basically, that's uh, also an in- inside joke for Evan because he's done a ton of artwork for ska bands. It's a cover oh, artwork, really? so that was kind of a, a jab at his kind of profession i guess oh i didn't know that <laughs> and then uh wilson phillips which was a good pun on wilson phillips and then the the, the end of the book was very sweet it was like mm-hmm. a very sweet tribute to george carlin at the end of the book where him and his daughter kelly who winds up going she's the rufus of the third movie his daughter kelly have a, a just a sweet wrap up to the book like you know maybe you'll get to see them again and he's like mm-hmm. if not i hope you do which is which was uh really sweet because george carlin died like a decade ago, I think. Right. Uh, and I, I'm glad they managed to find some way to include him in the third movie as well through a hologram. Yeah, you know, that's what I liked about the third movie, going back to that as well, was, and in this comic, since they're they're both connected, is that they didn't try to reboot things. Like, they could have easily, you know, did sort of with the daughters, just fully on eliminate that their dads are Bill and Ted and just make a, you know, just like they did with Ghostbusters 2016 just a, a girl version and reboot it and for younger generations. But I think it's smart when you connect the older film to to the newer film. And so, you know, you, I could see them doing a whole new trilogy with just the girls and I'd be fine with it. And that was, as much as I liked certain elements and I love the characters of Ghostbusters 2016, I felt they did a disservice by not actually making it in-universe connected to the original films. Like if they just said like, look, we're picking up the mantle and... You know, we're a new era of Ghostbusters. I think it would have been much better, and maybe they could have done a, also a better third act. But I, I, I would have been su- supportive of that. But unfortunately, they didn't, and I, f- I felt that the movie lost something, and which is why they ended up rebooting it, and we'll be getting Ghostbusters Afterlife pretty soon, which, which is, is more on par with like what you were saying, like exactly. a continuation, not a whole new universe. Mm-hmm. But well, overall, what did you think of the book? Excellent. Bog- no. <laughs> excellent or bogus uh excellent yeah. uh definitely recommend it for fans of bill and ted and you know it's 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 a great just fun read yeah it's a fun read and the art is on par with like that world like the yeah i, I really i thought the art was great for for this kind of story yeah uh, and the dad jokes and all that kind of stuff i loved it yeah yeah, yeah it was really fun it was a really fun read i wish i had read this because I think this came out right around the time of the third movie, and I wish For I had sure. read it back then. So, mm-hmm. but no, no, yeah, it was it was fun. If you if you're a Bill and Ted's fan, definitely pick this up. And if you're new to it and you just want to have a fun read, it, it, it's a short book. It's only like a hundred, hundred six pages or so. Yeah. Uh, so it's a real quick read. Yeah, just fun. So. Well, thanks for listening to our summer special. This is the last episode. We'll be back with our Halloween special, and then our holiday special and then uh we'll return in 2022 i can't believe that's a year that i'm living in 2022 (laughs) uh we'll be back in 2022 with the new season our sixth season of the podcast and yeah we just appreciate you uh listening to the podcast and hope you have an excellent summer stay excellent